Jeremiah 29, 12 tells us, then, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Patrick, Becca, thank you for that beautiful reminder that God hears. And not only does he hear, but he answers, right? And so grateful, grateful for you guys. Thank you all for that this morning. All right, this morning we're going to be in Genesis chapter. Uh, we're going to be in 4 and 5, but we're going to start in, in chapter 4 uh, briefly and then spend most of our time together this morning in chapter 5. Um, so if you want to go ahead and turn there for that. But I'm grateful for the honor and the privilege to... Um, to, to share or encourage, hopefully encourage you a little bit with God's Word this morning. Uh, and once again, be praying uh, for Chris and his family as they're traveling and, and make their way to Indianapolis this week as they attend the Southern Baptist Convention and, and all the things that will be going on there this week. And so um, let me pray for us this morning before we dive into God's Word and just ask Him to uh, give us ears to hear and um, and the hearts to, to, to and the minds to understand. Uh, Lord, I love you, and God, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful for the gift of the church. I'm grateful, Father, that we can gather together, we can assemble together, and we can lift our voices together and not be in fear of being heard, but we can boldly shout and we can boldly sing, God, without the fear of any type of persecution or danger. Father, may we never take that freedom for granted. Um, this morning, Jesus, as we open up the word, for Father, I pray that you will use it to encourage those who need encouraging. I pray you use it to comfort those who need comforting. And Father, I pray that you will use your word to pierce the darkest parts of our heart. And God, that those who are far from you will respond by grace through faith. Lord, we love you this morning. It's your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 and 26 tells us, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, I don't know when I first read this particular scripture, but that phrase always interested me. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And from the opening chapters of the Bible, God makes it clear that humanity was created to enjoy life with God and God in life, to experience the radiance of his presence and listen to him speak close up. And there's this idea of a nearness there. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden, which God himself provided for this very purpose. I mean, do you ever catch yourself just thinking about what that must have been like to walk with God in the garden every day? Like that, that was what Adam and Eve experienced. I mean, we, haven't, we don't experience that. I mean, we, we have an opportunity to walk with the Lord, and we're going to talk about this, that this morning. But I mean, in the very presence of God, surrounded not by sin, but surrounded in perfection. Not a hint of sin. I mean, the world was perfect. Everything was in harmony. And they are enjoying the presence of the Lord together daily. It's a, it was a beautiful thing, and we see that. And then somewhere around the time of when Enosh was born to Seth, people began to pray. And we don't have a lot of info here other than the Bible introduces this significant incident. And at this time in history, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. The discipline of prayer began to make its way into the lives of the people of the earth, that this discipline began that day, made its law, made its appearance that day in human history, where people began to call upon the name of the people began to pray. R.C. Sproul he once said, "Prayer is to the Christian what breath is to life. Yet no duty of the Christian is so neglected." John Piper he writes. One of the greatest uses of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and all of social media will be to prove at the last day that lack of prayer was not from a lack of time. 
those two men have challenged me in my prayer life by those two statements. I mean, completely radically shifted the way that I pray in, 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 the, in, the, in the importance and the discipline of, of, of having a prayer life in my life and, and a real prayer life. I'm not talking like one where I just come and ask God for a good Monday because, you know, or, or, you, know, or you have a three-day weekend and you got to go to back at work on Tuesday, right? But I mean an actual prayer where I'm like, God, shape my heart, create in me, create me to be more like you. Help me love like you do. Help me be patient like you're patient. Help me give mercy like you give mercy. Like mold me into the image of your son for the benefit of this community so that others will come and know and fear you. Like, that's how we ought to pray. God, use our church in a mighty way. Don't bless us. We don't care if you bless us financially. We ask that you use us, use us up, ring us out for your glory so that other people in Rainbow City, Southside, Gatson, Atala will come to know and fear and place their trust in the Lord, that men and women and children will be saved. And if we go broke doing that, then so be it. Let us use every single resource we have to do that. Is that how we pray? Or do we simply pray prayers where we're like, God, give me a good week. My gout is acting up. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be praying for others in supplication, but I mean, my goodness, we have a tremendous opportunity. We have a tremendous responsibility, not an opportunity, a tremendous responsibility to bear witness to Jesus in Judea, Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have been empowered with the Holy Spirit to go and do so. So may we be people who continue to speak with all boldness in the face of the threats of society in our community, that we continue to march under the banner of the gospel so that others will come to know the beautiful Savior, Jesus. So let us be people of prayer. And we see here that this is when prayer is first instituted in the lives of the people. And and this this mention of this moment in the history of man is significant. And we're going to see why here in a few moments as we dig into Genesis chapter 5. But we're also going to see how these two quotes I just read off just a few minutes ago kind of shape and play into it too. As as prayer life is neglected, as, as prayer life is kind of often overlooked or bypassed for other forms of entertainment or to to fill our time with that, that is not necessarily uh, beneficial to us in a way. And so in Genesis chapter 5, uh, we have this genealogy from Adam to Noah, and there's nothing really shared about any of these lives other than who fathered who. But seven generations into this genealogy, there's a man in the Bible puts a spotlight on. And even though it remains a brief look into this person's life, it's really fascinating, and it's really miraculous, and it really should be inspiring and challenging for each and every single one of us this morning. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, when I was growing up in in, 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 in church and, and being told, like, you know, here's what I was told about Enoch, that he didn't die. You know, that was kind of like the fascinating part of his life. Like, you know, there's Elijah and there's Enoch. Like, there's no record of either one of them passing. It just God took these guys. And that, and that was kind of the it. That was kind of the story. Like, th- this is what it is. And then, you know, if you were kind of a, a, a you know, a smart aleck teenager like me, it was like, hey, Methuselah, he fathered Methuselah. Methuselah was the oldest man on the earth. You know, it was kind of like Bible trivia. And it was just kind of like that was kind of it. And that was kind of the story that I was told about Enoch was that he just didn't pass away. And that, that was special. And, you know, and it is special, but there's so much more we can learn from this man's life. And, and let's just be honest for just a moment. Let's, I mean, this is really honest this morning with one another. You don't spend time or walk with people you don't enjoy being around. 
Right? I mean, that's not what we do. Like, the, the, like, we tend to avoid those people in our lives. Like, who's purposely going to lunch or dinner this week or driving over to Atlanta to watch a Braves game with someone who just absolutely, completely annoys you? Like, none of us are. Like, none of us are signing up for that trip. None of us are looking forward to that trip. We're not doing that. So we, we don't like, we don't enjoy spending time around people that annoy us. And so we don't, we, we don't read the words, walk with God, until we, get with Enoch, until we get to Enoch's 65th year. That's one family tree. That's five generations from Enosh to Enoch. That's 4,544 years, 45 and a half centuries from Seth's 105th day on the earth to Enoch's 65th. And we don't read this phrase again until three generations later. That's 1,400 years when we get to Noah, Enoch's great-grandson. We don't hear the words, this person walked with God. I mean, that's the length of time that's passing, right? And I I don't want us to get hung up on the ages of these people and how long they lived on the earth. But I just want you to see what the world looked like at this time. this This was what was going on. Right. This is the. This was the way. This was the culture. I guess, if you will, if you will. But this is what's happening here. So we don't. For, for from from Genesis four, when people began to call upon the name of the Lord, we don't read the words "walk with God" until Enoch's sixty fifth year. Five generations. Forty five hundred years. Psalm 139 tells us, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and you know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it altogether. Now, I shared this with you before, that when I, I, when I first read that, uh, it frightened me. Because if I'm honest with the Lord, if we're honest with one another, like, you know, we know our thoughts, right? We know the thoughts that honor Jesus, and we know the, our routines that honor Jesus. We know the things we like and dislike, and he does too, right? He knows the words we spoke that didn't honor him, and he, he knew them before we even said them, right? He knew them before we ever thought them, and that terrified me. But yet the beautiful part of that is even though we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? So, you know, praise be to God for that. But, it, but yet I read that to say that he knows his people, and the Bible describes the condition of the world in the eyes of the Lord is this, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's Genesis 6, 5. And the Lord knew the thoughts, the words, the ways of Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. He knew all of them. And the ages of these men, I mean, think about it, just take, just take, uh, Enoch, for example, for 365 years of that man's life, God knew his ways, his routines, his thoughts, his words, every single one of them. Every one of them. And so what we see here, what, is, what, the, what the Bible is setting up for us is that the world is a dark place, spiraled downward by the initial sins of questioning God's commands, jealousy, Ignoring God's instruction, murder, and lies. But in this glimpse, in this glimpse, we see hope. In this glimpse, we see a man redeemed. For 65 years, six and a half decades, Enoch enjoyed the passions of his flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, following not the shepherd that David would later describe God as in Psalm 23, but rather following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and continues to be at work in the sons of disobedience. For 65 years, Enoch was not called a child of God but he was rather a child of wrath, as Paul would state in Ephesians chapter 2. 
means 65 years. Is that, was, that's how Enoch was described. That was his life. But his life changed. And that should bring a lot of hope to you in the room this morning. Because some of you have children and some of you have grandchildren that don't walk with God. They have nothing to do with God. They, they, they live apart from God. They have no desire of God. They don't care about the things of God. They have no fruit of the gospel, of the spirit that resonates in their lives. Like they are completely and, 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 and separate, separating themselves from the love of God. And, uh, and they follow not the good shepherd, Jesus, but rather they continue to follow the course of this world. And they're enjoying every moment of the passions of their flesh and the desires of their mind. And this morning, please... Give attention to the fact that Enoch is known for what he did for the last 300 years of his life and not the first 65. And some of you need to hear that this morning, that you are God's chosen ones, you're holy, set apart to do good works, and you are his beloved, as Paul reminds us in Colossians chapter 3. But for but the story, I mean, the most basic thing that we can look at is here is we have a man's life that we're introduced to that we are told for 65 years this man did not walk with God. He walked with the world. And then through some miraculous encounter, his life changed. And for the next 300 years, he walked with the Lord. That is a beautiful thing. I mean, I don't know what you once said about you at your funeral, but for me, that's it. That's all I once said. I, I don't want people, to, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if people think I was a good dad or a good husband or a good friend or a good, you know, staff member or a minister or pastor or whatever. Like, I just want, the simplest statement could just be this. For 17 years, he didn't know Jesus. But for however many years I, you know, right now it's 30 years, he walked with God. That's it. Like he just walked faithfully. He wasn't a perfect guy. But he was faithful. He walked with Jesus. It resonated from his life. From the moment that God saved him, the description of this man's life was he walked with God. And so that one, we should find hope there. That for a long time, you know, 65 years, however you want to translate that, you know, into the life of your family. But there may be somebody in your family that for the last 18, 19, 20 years, they, they, they do not know God. But in that 21st year or the 22nd year or the 25th year, they might. Maybe you in your 65th year. And for the next 15 or 20 years, you walk faithfully with him. But it's a beautiful story. But it asks the question, you know, so we see, we see in Genesis 4, people begin to pray. And then we have seven generations. We don't hear anything spiritual about anybody's life until we get to Enoch, right? Until we, we get to Enoch and all of a sudden now, now we see a man who is described as walking with God. And so what does this walking with God look like? This is what we're created to do. We, I mean, we first read this phrase, walking with God in the Garden of Eden, right? I mean, here we have this moment, walking with God. Then we have this we have this uh, world-altering event that happens two chapters later in Genesis 3 where sin is introduced and now man is removed from the garden. And now there is, there is no walking with God in the garden anymore. And so, so that, is one of the mo that is the most, in my opinion, the most significant event in world history right there. I know we just celebrated D-Day this past week and, and that was a tremendous event in the lives of our country and of our people. But man, people, listen to me. There is no more significant event than the one that happened in the fall of man in the garden. It completely separated and it caused our need for a savior. And what most biblical scholars believe is happening when these people are begin to call on the name of the Lord is that they're actually calling on God to send the, the serpent crusher. The one that he said that, you know, when he said that I'm going to create enmity between you and the offspring and you're going to bite his heel but he's going to crush your head. That, that, that most biblical scholars believe that that's the prayer that was being asked 
to, of God is, oh Lord, send the serpent crusher. Send the one who's going to crush the serpent's head. Send him, as in Jesus. Send the Savior. Send the Messiah. Rescue us from our sin. Rescue us from this dark place. Bring the chosen one. Bring the Messiah. That was the prayer that many scholars believe that these people were praying. But yet we see decade after decade and century after century, we don't see, we don't read about people walking with God until we get to our brother Enoch. And what does walking with God look like? Like, how can we do that? What does that look like? And so we're going to talk five things I believe we can learn very quickly today in this, looking at our brother in his life. What begin, it, first, it begins with faith. It begins with faith. It begins with it. Enoch put his faith in God, that God believed, that he believed God was who God said he was. He believed God was good. Walking together implies there's a friendship, there's a nearness, and there's a love. Enoch wasn't a perfect man. Enoch was not a sinless man. Enoch was a man with a nature like ours, but by faith became pleasing to God, and by faith he walked with God. Now, what I don't want us to confuse this morning or interchange this morning or substitute this morning, I don't want us to substitute the word belief for the word faith. For the, even the demons believe, James tells us, and they shake, they are tremble at the name of Jesus. So, so let's, not, let's not confuse belief and faith. When I was 17 years old, that was me. I had a deep respect for the church. I grew up in church. My parents were, uh, were faithful in church. My dad was a deacon. My grandfather was deacon. My, and it, I know that story is not unique to me. It probably resonates with a lot of you. And I grew up in church and we were in church, but I did not love Jesus. I did not serve Jesus. I didn't think about the things of God. I didn't care about the things of God, but yet I had a deep respect for the things of God. Most people thought I was a believer already because I knew how to talk, I knew how to behave, and I looked and acted just the part. All that was is because I just had a deep respect of God because I knew of God. I believed there was a God. I believed God deserved reverence and fear and your respect, but I did not love him. And in my 17th year of my life, God saved me. He moved people into my life via the way of a lab partner in, bio, in advanced biology who was a, a bold enough in her faith to invite me to come eat lunch with her and her friends in the youth minister's classroom who was the part-time youth minister at their church, full-time chemistry teacher at a high school. And they began a friendship with me. Not a pro, I wasn't a project. They loved me. They cared about me. They, were, they became my friends, and I became their friends. And their goal end was not to make me a Christian or to get me to come to church, to add to the numbers. I wasn't a project to them. They, they genuinely cared about me, and they became my friends, and, I, and they became my friends. And, and, and through time, God, and being, being positioned in his word, being positioned with people who loved him and loved me, like God saved me by grace through faith. And so, so, so it begins there. And we don't, please do not substitute the word belief because I, I fear, I, my, I, my heart is broken for people. As I've been in, in, in vocational ministry for over 20 years now and I've worked with students and youth and kids and we have these, I hear these stories all the time where somebody will come to me and they'll say, my granddaughter or my daughter or my son or whatever, like, man, they were saved at vacation Bible school when they were eight years old, but they're 37 now and they, they don't come to church. They haven't been to church in over 20 years. And it's like, but they were baptized and they were saved. And I'm like, I, and they're holding on to that moment that they're believers and they love God. I'm going, I don't know if they do. I don't know if they do. And it's a dangerous game to play. And it's like, well, they believe. But I'm like, yes, that's great. So do demons believe. And they, and they tremble at the name of the Lord. But do they have faith? Do they live by faith? Do they walk by faith? Do they walk with God? Or do they, are they walking in the course of this world following the, its ways and the prince of the power of the air that is at work in the sons of disobedience? Because if they're following that, they're not following the good shepherd. And if they're not following the good shepherd, 
man, all they, all, they, all they recited at Vacation Bible School 30 years ago was a prayer. Just some words. Just some words. And they got wet. That's it. It's by faith. It's by faith that we are saved. It's by faith. So it begins, walking with God doesn't begin with belief. It doesn't begin with respect. It begins with faith. Enoch was a man who at some point by faith believed that God pardoned his sin, redeemed his soul, replaced his heart of stone, and put a new spirit inside him. Enoch found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and he was redeemed by grace through faith, just as it's the pathway for each of us. If Enoch had been pleasing to God by virtue of some extraordinary gift or talent or by some marvelous achievements and works, we all would be in a lot of trouble today. We would be without hope. But it was faith. It was by grace through faith that Enoch began Walking with God. So it's by faith. So it starts with faith. We walk, we, we, we walk with God. It looks like it begins with faith. Secondly, Enoch realized the divine presence. Enoch's faith was a realizing faith. He did not believe things as a matter of creed or, or, and then put them up on a shelf and out of the way as too many do. He was not merely knowledgeable of the commands of God. Rather, the truth and the light of the goodness of God had entered into his heart. And what he believed was true to him, practically true, true as a matter of fact in his daily life. So all that to say this is that it wasn't a bunch of it wasn't a bunch of Sunday school lessons that he listened to on Sunday morning and then on and then when he got home that afternoon just put it on the shelf and then walked away and ignored it for the rest of the week. There were things in his life it's like okay love is patient and love is kind it is gentle it does not boast it keeps no records of wrongs it's not in, it's not selfish or rude it's a it's a faith that says God. I'm a husband. Teach me how to love my wife that way. Because oftentimes it looks like selfishness and rude. And it's impatient and it's unkind. Help me love them that way. God, you tell me to love my neighbor as I would love myself. I love myself a lot. Look at my home. Look at my things. Look at what I spend my money on. Do I love my neighbor in the same manner? Help me do that. Help me not be the, the person who walks on the other side of the road when I see need and ignore it. Yet help me be like that Samaritan that day. Make me like that. Help me put these things that we learn into practical application in my life. He walked with God. It was not that he thought of God or that he speculated about God or that he argued or debated about God online or that he read about God or that he talked about God. Rather, he walked with God. You know, we talk a lot about discipleship and making disciples and being disciples and all that stuff. And we talk about sitting in a room and doing all that stuff. Like, how about this? How about we just walk with one another? How about we just invite one another into each other's lives and you get to see the ugly parts of me and I get to see the ugly parts of you and yet we still love one another because we know we're broken, fallen creatures and we encourage each other to walk more and more and more in step with Jesus? It's not about memorizing scripture. It's not about, you know, what do you know? It's, it's about walking together faithfully and having someone come alongside you to be a Christ-like example that says, hey man, I know the ugliest parts of your life and I still want to be here. Like, that's what discipleship looks like. It looks like having someone to call when you really mess up and they don't judge you, yet they respond kind of like Jesus does to the woman who's caught in adultery. He lifts up their head and he says to them, hey, where's your, where, where are your accusers at? They've all left. I don't condemn you. Now go leave your life of sin. Walk in another manner of life. Like, that's what discipleship is. That's what discipleship looks like. Those are the brothers and sisters you want to have in your life. Not the ones that come along and you say, yeah, those guys are morons and you're doing it all right. Maybe they are morons. And guess who else is a moron? You are. 
I am, right? I mean, you can ask the people who live in my house with me. They will confirm for you that I am a moron more often than not. You spend some time with me, you will probably say the same thing, all right? But he walked with God, which is the practical and trial and error part of true godliness. Look, none of us have this figured out. And if you think you are, you are just buying into the lies of our enemy. We walk by faith, not by sight. All right, walking by faith, not by sight, means you don't really see where you're going, right? We make plans, the Lord ordains our steps. So it's a trial and it's an error. It's let's try this. Let me, let me try to love my neighbor as I love myself. And when we, when we error, right, we have a beautiful reminder from our brother Paul who says, there is now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. Beautiful. And so we let the Lord to be a lift of our head. He's the shield about us. And we continue to work, walk forward. We continue to go. But man, I'm so grateful for the people that God spent my life to remind me of those things. So this is so he realized the divine presence. He is walking with God. This is not just some knowledge that he gains and puts on a shelf and just forgets about it, but he continues to walk. In his daily life, he realized that God was with him. And he regarded him as a living friend in whom he confided and by whom he was loved. I mean, do you re, do you do you think about God being present? in your life, in the car on the commute to work, in the restaurant this afternoon when the server is just a little bit slower than you're liking and getting your food out there. When the cooking staff may have put something on your plate that you asked specifically not to be put on the plate. Right? I mean, the Lord is his divine presence. Enoch realized the divine presence of the Lord, that the Lord was with him. And he was this living friend. He wasn't this omniant being in the sky that's just kind of hovering over. But he was with him in the details of his life. Remember what we read earlier, Psalm 139. He knows your thoughts, your routines, your ways, your words, before you even say them or think them. Enoch realized the divine presence of the Lord, his living friend whom he confided in and by whom he he knew he was loved. Thirdly, Enoch had a very familiar nearness with the Most High. If you, if you want to find someone's, if you want to find out who someone's best or most familiar friend is, it would be the one with whom he daily walks, who he spends a considerable amount of his day with. For example, when I was in college, if Shannon Lewis was my roommate. He was my best friend from high school all the way till this day. And we lived together for five years. And there wasn't something that happened in my life or something that happened in his life that he was not familiar with. I mean, we ate dinner together. We went to school together. We went to worship together. We played basketball together. We fought with one another. We argued with one another. Like We did everything together. And, and we were best friends. And so if, if you want to, and he was, it was very familiar. So when he would say things like this, somebody, you know, somebody could say this, Brian to this, and he would know whether that's, well, that's something Brian, that's not something Brian would do. That's not how Brian would behave. That's how Brian would respond. He knew that because we spent time together. He knew what was familiar and what was not familiar. If somebody said something about me or something like that, he said, that's not, that's not, that's not the Brian I know. Like that don't sound like the Brian I know. And the same thing could be for him. Like, it's the same thing. Like, that's not the Shannon I know. That, that's odd, or that's not, that's not the person I know. And that came from a familiar area. That came from a, a nearness. That it would, it, and so if you want to find that, it's, it's who you spend a considerable amount of your day with. For example, if you are much closer, you are much closer to someone who you've walked through the fields of trouble and climbed the hills of pain with, rather than someone you occasionally visit in their home and chat with for 60 minutes. Like, I'm close to my brothers. I mean, in trials and suffering, I mean, when my father passed away uh, 12 years ago, man, I had, that was, that was difficult. I, I haven't, you know, I mean, I, I, I haven't lost someone that close to me since I was a child when, when my uncle, who was more like a grandfather to me, passed away. And, and you know, it was, it was, you know, it was just odd. Man, but I had some dear brothers and families come and surround not just me, but they, they loved all my brothers and they loved all my mom. 
They drove to Mississippi to help me pack her house and move her to Kentucky. And, I mean, they gave me time off of work. To, I mean, they, they walked through pain and trouble with me. And you know what that's like. Some of you have lost someone. Some of you have about walked through cancer battles with other people. Some of you have walked through the, the fields of divorce and you've had people come alongside you and love you and, 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 and walk with you through those moments. And, and they're dear, dear friends to you. They're not, those are not people who just come into your home occasionally and you catch up on 20 years. These are people you walk with. These are people you know. In walking, friends become communicative. One tells of his trouble. The other strives to console or comfort him under it. Likewise, we share our joys and praise, our sorrows and prayer, and our sins and confession with our God. The heart unloads itself and all of its cares into the heart of him who cares for us. And the Lord opens the floodgates of his goodness and a sense of his own everlasting love on his sons and his daughters. So there's a nearness with God, Enoch had. Fourthly, there's Enoch, the Enoch's nearness with God was continuous. Like we don't see, he did not take a turn or two with God and then leave his company. He walked with God for hundreds of years. It is implied in the text that, that, that this was a defining marker in his life throughout the whole time of its 300 years. 300, excuse me, this was a defining marker of his life through the whole of its 365 years. Enoch walked with God after Methuselah had been born 300 years, and doubtless he had walked with him before. What a wonderful testimony. 300 years walking faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully with the Lord. Not that he decided, you know, walking with him for 100 and took 25 years off and then picked it back up later but continually walking with Jesus. Charles Spurgeon writes, One might desire a change of company if you walk with anybody else. But to walk with God for three centuries was so sweet that the patriarch kept on, kept on this walk until he walked beyond time and space, and he walked into paradise. He did not know and then climb to the heights of so he did not now and then climb to the heights of elevated piety and then descend into the marshy valley of lukewarmness. Yet he continued to, in the calm, happy, equable enjoyment of fellowship with God from day to day. Night with its sleep did not suspend it. Day with its cares did not endanger it. It was not a run, a rush, a leap, a spurt, but it was a steady walk. On and on through three happy centuries did Enoch continue to walk with God. That's beautiful. That is a beautiful testimony right there. So his life, his nearness with God was a continuous thing. And lastly, his life was progressive. At the end of 200, at the end of 200 years of walking with God, Enoch was not where he began. He was in the same company, but he had gone forward in the right way. At the end of the third century, at 365 years of age, Enoch enjoyed more, understood more, he loved more, he had received more, and he could give out more because he had gone forward in all respects. A person who walks with God will grow in grace and in the knowledge of God and in likeness to Christ. You cannot walk with God year after year after year without being strengthened, sanctified, instructed, and rendered more able to glorify God. For three centuries, Enoch's life was a life of spiritual progress. Listen, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will not take up residence in a person's life and leave that person's life unchanged. That, that's absolutely, completely opposite of what the Bible teaches. The passions of the flesh and the passions of the spirit are at war with one another. In other words, if you've got a friend that you dismiss their sinful behavior at this way, well, that's just the way Bob always is. So that's just the way Sharon always is. So that's just the way Brian always has been. Let me lovingly suggest to you that your friend hasn't been saved, that the Holy Spirit has not come into their life, taken control of their heart, and regenerated their spirit. But all, all too often, we'll dismiss people's sinful behavior. They're gossiping, they're backbiting, their divisiveness. And we'll say, because they attend church, they, it's, it's, it's somehow okay. No. 
The Holy Spirit, the passions of the Spirit are at war with the passions of the flesh. It puts to death those things. So we walk in a newness of life, not in continual sinful behavior that contradicts the scriptures. So it's so there's a there's a progression. So his walk was progressive. So walking with God for Enoch, look this way. It began by faith. It was he realized the divine presence. He had a very familiar nearness with the Lord, and his nearness with God was continuous. And his life was progressive. And and as we talk about these things, I, sometimes I think we can kind of take the humanity out of some of the people we read about in Scripture, and we kind of think, well, that was a different time. They didn't live in this thing. They didn't have this going on, or this going on, or this was involved in their lives. And Listen, walking with God didn't mean Enoch didn't face trials or worries. He experienced many of the same circumstances we do. Looking at his brief spotlight of his life here in Genesis chapter 5, we know that Enoch was a family man. We know that he had a wife, and we know that he had other sons and daughters after he fathered Methuselah. So, So he was a family man. And what does that come with? That comes with responsibility, right? I mean, he has to take care of a family. He has to provide for a family. He has to discipline children. He has to rear children. He has to educate children. He has a wife that he is called to protect and to love and to and to build a home with and and the struggles there, right? I mean, we can just look to our brother Job. In Job 1.5, it tells us that Job prays for his children. Job would rise early in the morning, the Bible says, and offer burnt offerings for all of his children. For Job said, or Job thought, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And Job did this continually. If you are a parent in this room and you can look at me with a straight face and say, I don't worry about my children. You're a terrible parent. Okay, like, I mean, that's, I'm just like, what do you mean? Like, I just followed them and just thought I'd just let them kind of go on their own and just kind of see if they could figure it out. And I'm like, oh, what in the world's wrong with you? Like, you should have never been giving kids, right? But yes, absolutely, we, we are concerned about our lives of our kids, right? I mean, my daughter just graduated from high school and she's going to be moving out of my house in a couple of months and going off to college. And, and, and there's a very strong likelihood, like for me, like her life will echo like mine. And in five years of going, in the five years after I graduated from high school, I was married and I graduated college twice already. I mean, her life, my life was radically different and it didn't look the same. It wasn't the same anymore. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm praying for her. I'm I'm thinking about her. My oldest son is kind of going at a crossroads right now in his life and, and I'm concerned for him. And so I pray for him. Right. So, so yes, we share in those same things. Enoch did too. He had kids. He loved his kids. He wanted his kids to grow up and be well and thought of and, and taken care of and members of society and, and all of these things. So all the concerns that you have that you share about your sons and daughters, Enoch did too. Enoch did too. Also, Enoch had a wife. Job 2, 9, 1, 10. And look, things weren't always great between he and his wife. We see this in Job, right? Job argues with his wife. She says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Like, hey guys, use that line on your wife today. In an argument, and tell me how that goes. Right? I mean, like, let's not pretend that life is always pretty inside our homes, right? I mean, we're two separate people. Men and women are different, and we butt heads, right? And so so, uh, Enoch had a wife, too. And there were times when it was good, and there were times when it was bad. Like, we'd be foolish to think that it was just perfect all the time. So there's, 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 there's moments of joy and happiness in their home, and there's moments of, of struggle and tension in their homes, just like there is in the Hibs household, and just like there is in your household, I would bet. And in all those moments, for 300 years, Enoch walked with God. It didn't put the pause button, it didn't say, okay, when, when I, I've gotta, I've gotta, my kids deserve 100% of my attention. No. You owe it to your children to give 100% of your devotion and attention to God. And let them see you walk in a manner of the Lord that makes them say, I want to I I walk with the Lord like my daddy does. I want a I relationship with the Lord like my mama has. That's what you owe. So we see he's a family man. Other, other, the other challenge we see in, Joe, in, in Enoch's life that we may we say, he just lived in a different time. No, he didn't. He lived in a very evil age. 
Enoch lived in a day of mockers and despisers. He lived when few loved God and when those who professed to do so were being drawn aside by others. He lived in the time where long lives produced great sinners. And great sinners had provoked a holy God who saw fit to sweep the whole population from the earth on the account of its sin in Genesis chapter 6. That was the world Enoch lived in. It's the same world we live in today. Surrounded by evil, surrounded by people who mock God, surrounded by people who despise God. And we are called to walk faithfully in that world. Enoch did too. So we see that there's, there's, we see he has a home, so he, he's dealing with the same things we deal with in our home. We see him, he lives in a, in a, a dark world world or dark community we live in one too and then we but we also see that Enoch also bore witness about God in Jude verses 14 and 15 the Bible records it was also about these that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied saying behold the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness and that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He was a man who stood firm amidst blasphemy and criticism, speaking the truth of God amongst the wicked lives of his age. It is clear that these people spoke against Enoch, and they rejected his testimony. They grieved his spirit, and he mourned that in this they were speaking against God. He saw their ungodly lives, and he bore witness against them. And we, so, see, so we see that Enoch not only walked, he was a preacher of the word of God. For 300 years, his life modeled a one, an Acts 1-8 witness. So this is when we see our brother Enoch in, in, in Genesis chapter 5. Let's not merely just read, oh, this guy walked with God and was not no more. But let's stop and pause and go, man, what does that life look like? And how does my walk with God look like? This morning, we're going to go into our time of invitation and response and, and, and really all this is is a time where we invite you to respond to how God has challenged you this morning through his word. So as, we, as Ron leads us in singing, this is going to be a time for you to pray. It'll be time for you maybe to come alongside a brother or sister in the room and, and just have them pray over you or pray with you. Maybe you would like me to pray with you. That would be an honor and it would be a privilege to do so. Maybe this morning you're like, hey man, for X amount of years I have not walked with God. But today... By grace through faith, God has rescued my heart. I believe, I confess with my mouth that he is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Man, it's that simple. The Bible tells us if you, believe, if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. Like there's no, there's no questionnaire, there's no test to take, there's no hoops to jump through. That's it. Confession, belief, salvation. So this morning, and that, that will start your walk with God progressively, every year, every day, every hour, you're getting nearer and nearer and nearer and nearer to him, just as our brother Enoch did centuries ago. This morning, I invite you to stand with me as I pray, and then we'll go to our time of invitation, and then we'll dismiss this afternoon. Lord, I love you, and God, I'm so grateful for the faithful life of our brother Enoch. God, I'm so grateful that you didn't tell us that Enoch was a perfect man, that he was a sinless man, that he did some this amazing thing in his life that deserved your love or your favor, but yet he was just a man who was just like us, who had a wife, who had kids, who had a job, who lived in the evil world, and yet, God, somewhere along the way in his 65th year, he found your favor and you saved him by grace through faith, and he responded by walking faithfully with you for the remainder of his life. And so, Father, May that be said of each and every one of us today, God. If we are walking with you now, may we continually walk with you progressively and continuously and faithfully. And Father, if we're not, if someone in this room is not walking with you, God, I pray that today will be the day that they take the first step and they partner alongside you, or excuse me, that they surrender their life to you and they follow you all the days of their remaining breaths. We love you. And it's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. The Savior is waiting to enter.